Piglet, welcome to my place. I'm new around here myself, but something tells me this is where I can find out about my ancestry. Where do little pigs come from? I'm just old enough to be told, though I'm warned the store is full of strange relatives and even some secrets a little pig really doesn't want to know. Mum told me which channels to zap to for some honest answers, so here goes. Is it a good thing to be a pig? Welcome to the world of pigs. Forget what you've heard about them being stupid, ugly, greedy or filthy. Take a pig's eye view and they become wonderful creatures, remarkable products of evolution, though in some cases with human tampering. Since the dawn of piggery, they've had to exploit every opportunity around them. Pigs can be the fat cats of the forest and savannas. Being a pig can be a real joy. Mm, I think I'm going to like some of this. Some humans can tell a pig a great deal about himself. Very good for pig esteem. I think he's beautiful. I think he's really, very cute. He's one of the cutest little guys I've ever seen. He's very, very loyal. He likes to sit on the bed. He'll lay on the couch right in my lap when I'm watching TV. He, he likes to play. He chases balls. He's just basically man's best friend. And a woman's as well, to keep things politically correct. Some of the most pampered pigs in the world live in California, USA. The pleasures of Beverly Hills are an everyday luxury for a Vietnamese pot-bellied pig. The ice cream is low fat. He wears designer clothes. He's a fashion statement. It's good. Pet pot-bellied pigs have become the rage of the 90s. In a word, they are cute. My mum said it's better to be clever than cute. This is more like it, and they look more like my own family. Now I can learn something. Pig IQ, week one. Come on, Grub. What's this one? Come on. Grub here is playing a game. You can do it. If she can fit the shape in the hole, she gets some grub. Come on, good girl. Hence her name. Good girl. You can do it. Go on. Good Psychologists girl. play the same game with children to test intelligence. The time taken to accomplish the task is a measure of learning ability. Intelligent animals able to learn quickly live longer in a hazardous world. It'll take a few more games yet to see how clever Grub really is. Oh, she's slow. What's on the other channel? Hey, this looks more fun. Turn. Turn. Good pigs. Good Miniature pot-bellied pigs take dancing and even playing music in their stride. Such intelligent tricks have brought them into the limelight, though they don't do much of this in the wild. I want to know is how did pigs like me get started? What's my line? OK, here's a home movie. That's you with your mum down on the farm. Safe, healthy and happy among your brothers and sisters. Little danger to worry about here, just the rough and tumble of the pigsty. Look, 
I've had enough of them to last a lifetime. What about the other kinds of pigs in the world? The ones that look quite different from me and Mum. You know, those in the ancestral portraits on the other walls. Over here. These are champions, selectively bred to suit human taste and fashion. Farmers commissioned artists to emphasize the size and portliness of their creations. They are all recognizably domestic pigs, even after centuries of breeding into hundreds of kinds. But all these domestic pigs share the same wild ancestry, and direct descendants of those original pigs are still at large today. Wild boars live in the forests of Europe and Asia as they have for millions of years. These are tough animals, undaunted by cold, ready to eat almost anything, and above all, adaptable to change. They've seen whole ice ages come and go, and were around long before humans. Eurasian wild pigs now exist in four main races, Western, Indian, Eastern, and the Indonesian wild boar. When humans latched onto the idea that roast pork tasted good, this hardy beast took its place in the gallery of domestic pig history. So, you see, young piglet, there's more to pigs than bacon. Sorry, than size and beauty. Pigs are the most widely distributed of all large mammals, largely due to their own wanderings and colonizations. That's right, take a look at the globe, and nearly everywhere there's a pig of one kind or another. Some chose to live in the cold forests of Europe, others explored Asia and its tropical jungles. And on the hot, dangerous continent of Africa, there lives a warthog. Remember, it's not ugly, just superbly suited to the life it leads and the risky land where it lives. Pigs have no sweat glands, so they must rely on water and shade to avoid sunstroke. Warthogs wallow to cool themselves and to remove ticks and other parasites. A warthog making a pig of itself in the mud is a rewarding sight in wild Africa. And for warthogs, there's method in the oddness of grazing on their knees. They can get down to eating grass and roots which other grazers don't eat. This means warthogs don't have to migrate to find lush growth, as most plains grazers do when the season changes. Across the continent, in West Africa, live other pigs whose colour and form make them beauties among these beasts. Only male Red River hogs have the prominent bony ridges and calluses on the muzzle used in fighting. But both sexes have the tasseled ears that make them such distinctive pigs. These are hogs in fancy dress. They root about for bulbs and fallen fruit like most pigs, ploughing up the leaf litter for whatever they can find. But why do they have such decorative ears? A suggestion is that when the head is shaken, other animals see the waving tassels as a threat. They seem to increase the pig's size. Ancient Africa once had an array of wild pigs. Today, five kinds live here. But all wild pigs may have evolved first in Asia. Between Borneo and New Guinea lies the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Its tropical forests are home to the most bizarre pig alive today. The Babirusa is a rare pig on the verge of extinction. Shy family groups live deep in the rainforest. Babirusa is Indonesian for pig deer, and females are deer-like in appearance. But the male has remarkable tusks, unique amongst pigs. 
Local legends suggest the animal hangs from the trees on its tusks, though exactly why isn't mentioned. And females don't have tusks. This mother has only one youngster. Babarusa usually give birth to only one or two piglets at a time, one reason for their rarity. The male's extraordinary tusks are not used in combat and are even a liability to their owners. If the animal lives long enough, the tusks grow so lengthy they can penetrate the skull and brain. An unpleasant end for a babarusa. On the nearby island of Borneo live quite different pigs. In families and herds known as sounders, these bearded pigs travel through the rainforest. A dominant female is the family leader. Most pigs live in matriarchal societies. Just why they have such bushy beards in such hot, humid conditions is not known, but it certainly makes them distinctive. Soil in a rainforest is poor. Nutrients are mainly in circulation within the trees. But there are roots, fungi and tubers to be sniffed out and there's much competitive ploughing for a meal. A hundred feet or more above their heads, trees, such as figs, are fruiting. Even these pigs can't fly, so they must wait for others to drop the riches of the tree canopy to the forest floor. Orangutans, the old men of the trees, swing lazily towards a canopy feast. Fruiting trees may be miles apart. Birds, macaques and other animals are drawn to such feeding centres. And the bearded pigs track the canopy raiders by smell and hearing. They are well used to the fact that primates are messy feeders, dropping more than they eat to the ground. In come the gardeners of the forest, rotivating the leaf litter, ploughing the compost, rooting out the fallen fruits, distributing the vital seeds. Pigs are essential to the working economy of a rainforest. When food is abundant, the females may breed twice instead of once in a year. More piglets survive and the pig population explodes. When the food runs out, the pig families move on in a mass migration. They may travel for hundreds of miles to find some other distant bonanza. sustain too many pigs and, ultimately, a balance will be restored. Despite their obvious urge to travel, no wild pigs reached the Americas. But pig-like animals do live here, in the forests and in the deserts of the New World. This is Arizona. These are peccaries now found only in the Americas. But millions of years ago, they had cousins in Africa and Eurasia. Curiously, they're as closely related to the hippopotamus as they are to the true pigs of the old world. But like pigs, they have a remarkable snout. A precision hunting device with a tough, flexible tip for digging and nostrils that can be closed to keep out soil. American peccaries may not be pigs, but peccaries can live and feed just like pigs. The only true pigs in America are your domestic kin. And, as you know, 
they were originally bred from Eurasian wild boars. But why? What made these animals the most suitable for domestication? Like the bearded pigs of Borneo, Eurasian wild boars live in sanders of some 20 animals, with a dominant matriarch in charge. Theirs is a gregarious life in a closely bonded and mainly female society. These groups are only approached by mature males in the mating season. Then, each male joins a sander of related individuals and fights any other male approaching his females. These are aggressive and dangerous animals. They can wound each other mortally in spite of the natural protection of heavily padded shoulders. For humans, their appeal lay in their living in large groups in the forest and in their adaptability to changing conditions. They are the toughest of all pigs and were quick to exploit new landscapes. Today, wild boars readily raid the crop fields to the annoyance of farmers. But it was this opportunism and ability to eat almost anything that was one credential for their future domestication. When river levels drop, leaving fish stranded, wild boars are the first on the scene. They know that hidden in the mud, there's a wealth of protein for the taking. They are hunters of live prey and scavengers with wide taste. They are as omnivorous as humans and make real pigs of themselves on occasions like this. It's little wonder someone long ago decided to make real pigs of them. Wild boar produce large litters, perhaps their most important potential domestic quality. When it was time to give birth, this sow left the sounder and produced her litter. The piglets are always striped when born. It's good camouflage. A sow can have up to 14 piglets. Not all the mother's teats give the same amount of milk. Each youngster competes to establish ownership of a good one, to which it returns every feeding time. They'll be weaned at three months old. Piglets owning the best milk supplies grow faster and stronger. Those getting least milk are the runts of the family. To those early people, domesticating useful animals, the Eurasian wild boar was an obvious choice as your ancestor. And they did try others. The babirusa, for example, was long-lived and easy to tame, but only produced very few piglets. They were simply not sufficiently prolific compared with the Eurasian boar. So, what about the bearded pigs of Borneo? They were certainly prolific enough. Their litters are large and they breed easily. The trouble was, they're far too agile 
and not at all easy to hold in captivity. And the African warthog was another reject, again mainly on the grounds of not producing enough young. Also, warthogs like to hide underground, usually in a second-hand burrow. It's a refuge built by a creature called an aardvark. It's the right size and has a steady temperature, keeping the family cool by day and warm at night. A female warthog has only four nipples, so very few young not a formula for domestic pork production. But it's all right for restocking the savanna with warthogs, though the youngsters are too vulnerable at this stage to be allowed out to wander. For the moment, in their aardvark nursery, they are safe from predators they've not yet seen. And roast-sucking warthog never made the menu as a regular dish. For better or worse, man and the Eurasian wild boar seemed made for each other. Piglets were produced in satisfying numbers with appetizing regularity, and there was no shortage of wild boars themselves. I think I'm getting it. We live long, we eat anything, we can be taken anywhere, and we like living in groups. What would my ancestors have thought if they could have gazed into a crystal ball and seen their future? Without those first domesticated pigs, the history of civilization and of exploration might have been very different. Pigs put the trotters into globe trotters as people set out from Asia into the Pacific to settle the remotest islands. Westward ho with Columbus and others to the Americas and all corners of the world. Thousands of years ago, pigs were brought to New Guinea. The islanders were not averse to the pleasures of roast pork. But more importantly, pigs became symbols of wealth a kind of grand piggy bank, whose current account statement is a measure of a family's position in society. The women are in charge of this living treasury, and the wealth itself nestles happily in the bosom of the family. Each pig is a form of cash, ready to be spent to buy land, a wife, or even to settle a war. Here is a nest egg in the making. All pigs make nests, and her owner is only too happy to lend a hand. The interest on his savings is about to be paid. More pigs. The man with many pigs in New Guinea is a rich man indeed. So you see, dear piglet, breeders have transformed the wild boar into pedigree champions. Your worldwide family, once domesticated, became big business, with the emphasis on big. to survive in the wild, but then none will ever have to. All are entirely dependent on their human owners. And modern pigs are quite different from those of a century ago, as you've probably noticed. You were involved in a scene like this not too long ago. This sow is routinely producing more than 80 piglets a year. She's pregnant for two-thirds of her life. 
Confined in this farrowing crate, she is prevented from crushing her family. A sow only lets down her milk at intervals. Just like young wild boars, these piglets jostled for best nipple at birth. Some will feed better than others. Young pigs grow at an amazing rate. These were born just days ago. Their progress is regularly checked. Four of them together clock up eight kilos, roughly two each. They've doubled their weight already, and by six months, each should weigh some 70 kilos. Well fed, warm and safe, they're on a pork production line that is part of a multi-million dollar business partnership. I feel a bit homesick. Do people really love us pigs? Yes, Tom Alty does. Tom is a retired teacher with a passion for pigs. And this one is his pride and joy. That's a lady. That's a lady. This is Marshland's Dorothy, and she is a middle white sow. Steady, girl. The middle whites are the rarest of all British breeds of pig. In fact, there are perhaps a hundred breeding females in the whole of the world. Well, see, she's such an appealing thing to me. The breed themselves are so docile, they're built for comfort. And they have such a wonderful temperament. But above, above anything else, they have this characteristic face, this, this lovely upturned nose and these wide, tilted ears. That nose becomes more up upturned as the pig goes older. There's no half measures with middle white pigs. People either say, oh, how beautiful, or they say, yuck. And, and really, that's the, the two responses that you get. I feel they have a, a beautiful kind of ugliness about them that I find particularly appealing. Beauty, I know, is in the eye of the beholder, but look at that. That's perfection on four legs, that. Marshland's Dorothy, second to my wife. He certainly got the right idea about us. Who else is there? Well, you remember the Vietnamese pot-bellied pig craze in California? This one's called Maynard. Maynard, come here. He's a high-class pot-bellied pig with a good address in Beverly Hills and a companion called Cecil. Cecil come. That's the other pig, not Marcy Campbell, whose house they share with unbelievable freedom. They live in luxury and the kitchen is their favourite haunt. Their portraits are on the wall. A rogues gallery for a couple of porkers who couldn't possibly have more freedom and love than they get from Marcy Campbell. I've had Cecil for two years, Maynard for three years. They make wonderful pets. What do you guys want? Wave. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. Here, Cecil. Here we go. Which one is my favorite pig? How can I choose between these two sexy boys? But it, it would have to be Maynard. Maynard is the genius of the two. Cecil's sweet, but he's a little bit of a doofus. He, he's very skittish, but he's very sweet. Bless you. They're totally different, but they're wonderful. They're very loving. They're highly intelligent. They're a lot smarter than a dog. You can train the pigs within five minutes where it takes a dog a few weeks. That's going to upset a few dogs, no doubt. But just watch Maynard on this food dispenser. Push. And after the family meal, Maynard loves to watch his favourite soap. Oh, 
okay, we're clever and it's a joy to be a pig, but is that the whole story? No, it's not. Sometimes things don't work out so well at home for pot-bellied pigs. They get kicked out, but with luck, some end up here. This is a kind of pig paradise for neglected and abandoned pets. It's hard to believe, but owners can lose patience with their corpulent house guests, particularly when they are less than careful with their personal habits. Susie Parkinson in Solvang, California, now has the undying devotion of some 35 refugees, victims of the end of the fashion for owning pot-bellied pigs. Come on, Caroline. Come on, Kelly. Come on, Great. Come on, breakfast time. Come on, Caroline. Kelly. Come on, Kelly. Come on, Great. Great. Hurry up. Great. Breakfast. Great. Expectations. Come here. Great Get expectations, Caroline, Kelly and the others have found sanctuary at Little Orphan Hammies. Susie struggles to pick up the pieces of their lives, to give them a little of the luxury they grew up with, and as much as she can of the love that former owners once showered upon them. PJ was my first pig. I got PJ from a pet store four years ago when the, the craze was still pretty hot and they were going, they were still up in thousand dollars. Well, I bought PJ and I was told always feed him no more than a quarter of a cup because you want to keep him small. And I was told PJ would stay 25 pounds when he was full grown. And I knew a little better, but being as, you know, he was my first pig, I didn't know everything. So, as you can see, PJ is no longer 25 pounds. <laughs> he was 25 pounds a month after I got him. PJ is now a well-loved 300-pound monster. The others were less fortunate and were simply turned out of their comfortable homes. The bottom fell out of his world, but he's landed on his feet. No, I'm not telling you anymore. Get home. That's naughty, naughty. Do you understand me? Bad behavior is common among the rejected pets but Susie handles them with discipline and real love. No, I know. You're always naughty. No, you don't. You get home. You go to your house. OK, play there. Susie knows every one of their sad stories. Hey, Bubba. And this is little Bubba. And Bubba came from the shelter in northern or southern California. The neighbor had turned him in. They had kept him tied as a baby, which, as you can see, it deformed his back. And the rope sort of grew into him, so the rope was removed at the shelter. It was all the way in his back. So Bubba was released to rescue, and he's the sweetest little pig. Took a lot of time to pick up trust and... When he first came here, he was real shy to the touch. Come on, Bubba. Now you just live for food, don't you? Yes, you do. And Bubba's learned how to kiss. <laughs> so, that's Bubba's story. Pigs are not everyone's idea of a house pet, but it's sad to learn that people can be so thoughtlessly cruel. Rosemary's here because she ate so much food she couldn't get up. When she was bought as a little piglet, she was free-fed dog food. They would open a big 50-pound sack of dog food, and they thought Rosemary was a dog, and let Rosemary eat anytime she wanted. Well, Rosemary ate every day and every night to the point where she couldn't hold her weight up. She literally blew herself up to one big, fat pig. And ever since, Rosemary is on a diet. Wow. Life has to be better for wild pigs. No, it's not. Warthogs in Africa face far worse dangers, though they are in charge of their own fate. Warthogs are the target of many predators.
It is the warthog's stamina and strength that can protect them. Lions tire quickly. Warthogs won, lions nil. But there's always tomorrow. So, are you saying that life's safer with humans? Not really. Humans can be a deadly enemy in the forests of Borneo. The bearded pigs have been hunted and killed for their meat for some 35,000 years. These Dayak hunters are only using spears, the traditional weapon. They are pitting their wits and experience against the acute senses, speed and agility of their prey. One bearded pig will be ample food for several families in the longhouse. But first, the forest spirits must be placated and the success of the hunt itself celebrated. The pig mask reminds villagers how much their lives depend on the boars. Entrails are roasted over an open fire. The rest of the meat divided amongst the hunters. That's the Dayak tradition. But there's less meat today. Much rainforest has been destroyed by loggers, the hunting range restricted. For how much longer will they enjoy the delicacy of wild pig meat? The abundance of the past is commemorated in jawbones, trophies of their ancient relationship with the bearded pigs of the forest. The feast is also a sacred ritual. The tribal elders have gathered to listen to an account of a woman's dream. They will interpret her dream by looking at the structure of this pig's liver, its various different lobes. It's a kind of pig palmistry. The elders will attempt to tell the woman's future. Once, the Dayaks were headhunters, and these rituals were used to predict the success of a manhunt. Pigs are most important to people as meat. Oh no, oh no, oh no! All over the world, people eat pig. The land race is the commonest domestic breed. Its virtue, good lean pork. Pigs are simply converters of vegetable matter into animal protein, and they do it four times better than cattle. Remember, a piglet in only six months becomes 70 times heavier. Then the not-so-little piggies go to market. Worldwide, over one billion modern farm pigs become 78 million tons of pork, bacon, gammon, sausages, trotters, liver, loin, ham. Humans eat more pork than any other kind of meat. In many countries, pork is the main source of animal protein. Uh, 
I need to change channel. Not all pigs are bred for food. Some find a place in medical science. They are the lifesavers among pigs. Human life, that is. Some parts of pigs are almost human in structure. Researchers sometimes call pigs horizontal humans. The skin can be successfully grafted over a severe burn. Pig pancreas is a source of insulin for diabetics. Pigs are sacrificed in the cause of controlling alcoholism, obesity and various diseases. Pig heart valves have been very successful spare parts. And in the future, whole hearts from genetically engineered pigs may be transplanted to save a human life. There's little advantage for the pig other than people's enhanced appreciation of them. I see. We're only wanted for our bodies. There's not much joy in that. Mum didn't say anything to me about such awful things. I have heard there are some people who can't stand the sight of a pig, who wouldn't eat a pig to save their lives. Those sound like my kind of people. Let's see. Under pigs as taboo animals, unfit for human consumption. Hmm. A number of the world's religions regard pigs as unclean animals. Several hundred million Muslims strictly observe the Quran's prohibition on eating any form of pig meat. Hindus likewise believe pigs are taboo. And Jewish scripture specifically forbids the consumption of pork, among an impressive array of other abominations. It's all good news for pigs. But why are they so denigrated? Religious prohibitions may have arisen from a pig's delight in feeding on refuse. Pig flesh can harbor parasites. But another origin may be the fact that pigs cannot be herded, like sheep and camels. So, in the Middle East, the nomadic rulers couldn't keep them. Pigs were raised and eaten only by the sedentary peasants, the lowest classes. I think people are really strange. Some hate us, some love to eat us. Let me try channel PIG. They talk about our little known qualities. There, smell. Southern France, and a region where a pig's acute sense of smell is highly valued. In fact, in the countryside of Lot, the right pig with the most sensitive nose can soon be on the trail of a small fortune. This is the land of the truffle. These pigs are about to have their noses tested. Which one is going to be best at sniffing out a hidden truffle? Bits of truffle, a fungus, are tucked under Madame Amar's foot. Pigs find them irresistible. But some pigs try harder than others. Madame Amar is expert at judging which pig is the most enthusiastic. She makes her selection. The gifted apprentice is on its way to the privileged life of a truffle pig. The animal is going to have to earn its keep and will need no training. If, as Madame Amar expects, he is the pig with the golden nose, he will ensure an important contribution to the family's income. How awful if the pig fails and has to be exchanged for another. But the farmer is always prepared for that. These oak woodlands are excellent truffle grounds. The family has owned the land for generations. The new pig, now named Titu, will be sniffing in the footsteps of many sensitively nosed forebears. The truffles are underground, out of sight. 
They are the fruiting bodies of a fungus on the roots of the oak. A pig's nose is many times more sensitive than a human's. Titu will soon catch the strong aroma of truffles floating up from the soil. And then he'll root around to find them. His ancestors, the wild boars, have always hunted truffles. It's a natural partnership that also spreads truffle spores. If Madame Amar is not constantly alert, Titu will eat the precious delicacies. But Madame Amar has sharp eyes and an experienced hand throughout the long hours she and Titu will hunt together. Titu makes a find. He's allowed a couple for himself, but most go into the basket. They're far too valuable for even the finest pig to scoff too many. Truffles are only in season for four months, from November till March, and this is one of the very few regions in the world where they grow. They cannot be cultivated. Their price at market will be high. Truffles are the black diamonds of France, and for Titu, such diamonds are a pig's best friend. It's market day at L'Albanc. Truffle buyers are here from gourmet restaurants all over Europe. Each vendor has a basket crammed with the finest truffles. Madame Emar has brought hers. Their price? $800 per pound. Buyers examine these black diamonds with the skill of jewelers. The aroma is as heady as the prices. But every farmer knows his prosperity today is due to the special skills of the pigs, whose noses have rooted out a fortune for them all. Tito seems to know he's done well. Pigs are better truffle hunters than any dog. Madame Amar can be proud of her choice. Their partnership is one of the strangest and most lucrative in the world. That's the job for me. A taste of the finer things in life and admiration for my skills. Piglets are cute, amusing and seemingly full of joy. just discovered that most people have a pig at home in one form or another. Now that says something for our kind. We have an undoubted talent to amuse. So stop thinking of us simply as bacon. Think Hollywood! Pigs are big in pictures these days. Some of them even talk. But thankfully, not all the time. This international film star is Gordy. He's a real celebrity and owes it all to his agent, one of the world's leading pig trainers, Diana Smith. She's also his chauffeur. In fact, he'd be a nobody without the skills and affection of Diana. How does she do it? My job in the picture business, TV or commercials is training animals, mostly farmyard animals, uh, mostly the pigs. To train a little pig for the pictures, uh, you've got to bond with them first, uh, become their surrogate mother, so to speak, and, and go from there. You just keep working at sitting, staying. Little pigs are what I call 
like working with a two-year-old baby. They got the terrible twos. They're very active. They're very wiggly and squirmy and, and hard to deal with, but not untrainable. They are very trainable. I love my pigs. <laughs> they're, they're nice to work with. Uh, it's challenging. It's something different all the time. They can come up with something new for you to work on all the time. I wonder how intelligent you have to be to be a film star. Pig IQ, week six. Right, no. No, properly. Grub no. is striving for perfection now and is earning a lot of praise and reward. That was very good. Good pig. This one. Try it. Oh, that was very close. A little bit more nudge. You can do it. Yes, a little more. Good girl. That's very clever. Well, I knew you could do that. This one. Good girl. I knew it. Six okay. weeks of school, and she's clearly got the idea. Pigs are remarkably intelligent, one reason for their success in the wild and perhaps for the deep bond that can form between a pig and a human companion. People have always liked pigs. It's hard to say why. I think they're a wonderful animal. They, they're loving. They're, they, they can talk to you. They have eyes that are human. They're just enjoyable. I don't know. I think it's probably their face and their flat little snout. <laughs> I'd much rather kiss my pig than my husband. But <laughs> I'm not going to kiss your mouth. I'm not going to kiss your mouth. Anyway. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to snuggle with a pig? <laughs> oh, PJ. I want one like her when I grow up. Pigs, on their own, explored much of the world. And with a little help from people, they conquered most of the rest. As food, they've been exploited. But as companions, they have enriched human life in extraordinary ways. You can't call me pig ignorant now, though I am a little confused. I wonder if my life is going to be a joy or not. The trick, it seems, is to be in the right place at the right time. After all, that's just what happened to that pig in California with Susie Parkinson. That's where I'll go and lie in the sun and guzzle ice cream all day and take long walks on the beach and be a film star and be famous all over the world. A piglet stream come true. Right, how do I get to the airport?